friends, and welcome to another episode of Chapters here on Armstrong Cable. Chapters is the program that profiles local writers, authors, publishers, and editors in our community. I'm Elliot Parker. Nice to have you with us for another episode today. We have a, a very distinguished guest with us today who has recently published a book uh, that is a fantastic book and a fantastic read if you're looking for something to add uh, to your reading list. And our guest today is John Van Kirk. And John Van Kirk uh, joined the U.S. Navy in January of 1980, and he completed Aviation Officers Candidate School in Pensacola, Florida, and was commissioned in May of that year. And in 1981, he graduated from flight school and was designated a naval aviator. He served for three years as a pilot in helicopter anti-submarine squadron 7 based in Jacksonville Florida in 1989 he was accepted into the MFA program at the University of Maryland where he studied with Joyce Kornblatt Howard Norman and Stanley Plumley, completing his degree uh, in 1991 and then after two years of traveling including a seven-month voyage around the Greek Islands in a 10-meter scoop and an Atlantic crossing in a 38-foot cutter Van Kirk joined the Marshall University faculty uh, in 1993 and he's been there ever since balancing his career uh, of writing and teaching and John Van Kirk it's a pleasure to have you today. Thank you so much for joining well, us. Well, thanks for having me. Um, I must say I've only read about a third of your book, but uh, I can't put it down. It's a fantastic read, and I think a lot of our uh, readers who are looking for something to add to their reading list will be very pleased with your selection. So let me ask you a little bit about you as a writer first. What sure. got you interested in writing? How did you start writing? And, and uh, what got you interested in the whole process? Well, actually, my mother was a writer, and uh, she published three novels in her lifetime. Um, so I grew up with around writing, and uh, she uh, had a, she loved to read, and uh, I can remember from my earliest childhood that she would be writing short stories and, and things like that, so it seemed quite natural to become a writer. Well, when you think of writing, who are some writers that, that you really admire <laughs> who have influenced you? I'm sure there's probably plenty. Uh, well, there are plenty. And you know, with any time you asked me that, I'll probably would I probably would answer it in a different way. Um, as an American male writer, I was influenced, as we all have been, by Hemingway. Not necessarily in a good way. I think uh, I came under his spell, and it took me about five years of hard work to get back out from under his spell. Um, I now teach a lot of international writers, and uh, they have absolutely been influencing me. Uh, I'm a tremendous admirer of the writing of uh, V.S. Naipaul, um, although to all, all reports suggest that he might not be a very nice person. He's a spectacular writer. Um, and recently, um, I discovered, as we say, um, for myself, he had been discovered by others long before, the uh, Colombian writer um, Alvaro Mutis, uh, M-U-T-I-S, and he's just blown me away with his novels about a character he calls uh, Macrol El Gaviero, The Lookout. Uh, wonderful stuff. Well, it sounds, sounds very interesting, and I know um, when you sit down to write something, oftentimes it's a subconscious thing that happens. A lot of those writers that you've been reading, you pick up little tricks and little traits sure. that they use. Sure, sure. So talk to us a little bit about, about Song for Chance. I know this is a book you've been working on for, for, for quite a while. Take us through how you decided to come up with this book and where the inspiration came for this kind of a story. Well, it's, um, I want to start with a, a dream or almost a nightmare that um, I had for many years. And that was that I would, I would find myself on a stage in front of a crowded auditorium. Um, of people who were awaiting me. The lights would come on, I would be standing there, I had a guitar in my hands and a band behind me, and I suddenly realized, oh no, I never learned how to play the guitar. And so it turned into a kind of nightmare. But I've loved music all my life, and I would say to myself, I wish I could play the guitar, I wish I could play the piano. Um, and along with that wish, I guess I finally decided, you know, it's time to do it. And I also started to have an idea about a, a novel about a musician. And uh, so I started taking music lessons. I started taking guitar lessons and piano lessons about the same time as I started writing the novel. And uh, the excitement of learning this, the language of music and learning to actually play in my own primitive way a couple of instruments that I had wanted to play for my whole life really fed into 
the creation of these characters and the writing of the book. So tell us a little bit uh, about the book. It, can you give us a, a summary of the book and what, what happens in that particular in that particular story? Well, um, the main character, his name is Jack Voss. He's a, uh, he's a piano player. He started out um, as a kid playing the accordion, taking those very formal lessons that many children had to take. Um, when the Beatles came around, he and his pal, um, Hal, uh, actually at the time, Harold Prochesky, who became, becomes Harold, Hal Proteus in the novel, um, they formed a band and uh, he just was, became a rock and roll player from then on. Um, in his college years, he struck it lucky um, with a, a record that just went crazy, um, was on the brink of huge fame. Um, and then uh, the tragedy that is sort of in the background of this novel occurred and uh, threw him into a bit of a tailspin. Uh, when we actually meet him in the book the first time, we get the backstory bit by bit. Uh, but when we first meet him, he's a guy in his late 50s playing in clubs, um, singing some of his old songs, singing jazz standards, and uh, getting along. He doesn't lack for money, but uh, he's kind of a lonely man. And then he suffers a personal tragedy that gets the book started. Interesting, very interesting. Can you talk to us a little bit about your writing process for this book and and, and how you wove it together and, and, and maybe that could shed some light on your writing process in general and, and because one of the things we found with all of our authors here on Chapters is every writer does things a little bit differently. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, this book was certainly not written in sequence um, and probably most of what I've written is not written in sequence. Um, once I get the basic idea uh, and a couple of characters, I start to think of the book in terms of scenes. And uh, I try to imagine what scenes I'm going to need to tell my story. And then I just write them in whatever order th it, seem it turns out to be convenient. If I get stuck on one, I skip ahead to another. If I get stuck on that one, I may skip back into the past and write a scene from back there. And with each scene that I kind of get completed, I have a better idea of which other scenes I will need um, before I'm, com I'm done. Um, and then late in the process, uh, what I did was I, I took, I had a, a very large bulletin board and I had a little note, post-it notes for every scene, not chapters, but every scene and I started to order them and put them in the order that I wanted. I actually color-coded the <laughs> scenes that were from the past, uh, from the backstory, uh, differently from the scenes that were in the present because the present of the novel sort of takes, moves around the, art, the, the, the passage of a single year. Um, and uh, once I got the right organization, I did another rewrite of the book and uh, here it is. Fantastic. Um, when, when you sat down to write, did, did, did you give yourself a goal? Um, for example, at the end of this week, I'm going to have these many scenes written, or did you did you just write until it felt complete to you? Uh, and, and not really. And you know, I have a full time job, so uh, I, I didn't. I, I don't have the luxury of, of doing that necessarily. Um, a lot of the writing was done at uh, writers' colonies and artists' colonies, and there I just try to write as many hours in a day as I possibly can and just keep it going, just cranking it out. Good, bad, or indifferent, get that first draft to completion. Um, but no, I, I don't think I gave myself those kinds of specific goals. I just tried to uh, write as much as I could and as well as I could. Fantastic. Can you talk <laughs> to us a little bit, too, about uh, the, the publishing process? How did you go from completing that manuscript to, to, to getting it uh, in the published form? Well, um, I, I, I'm very fortunate to have an agent, um, and uh, my agent took the book and shopped it around at uh, the major publishing houses. I got a lot of very nice rejection letters <laughs> from uh, some very high-powered editors, and uh, now, as you know, there are fewer and fewer of those big, high-profile houses, um, and uh, so... Uh, she knew some people at Red Hen Press and said, what would you think about, you know, taking a shot at this 
smaller uh, publishing house, but very respectable. They published some wonderful poetry and uh, uh, some very good prose as well. And so we sent it to them, and, and they liked it. And uh, we did one more a revision with the editors of, of Red Hen. Uh, but the process was a long and slow process. Uh, I, I, I guess I started this book nearly 10 years ago and probably spent four to five years in writing it and another three or so in getting from acceptance into print. Well, wow, that, that, at any time along the way, did you, did you find yourself getting frustrated with it or, or, or wishing, wishing you could, you know, f- put the throttle and fast forward oh, to get to the completion? Oh, absolutely, absolutely, but uh, one has to be patient. Yeah, absolutely. Um, wh- what would you say uh, to, a re- to a reader or, uh, or someone who's thinking about uh, picking up this book? Uh, wh- what do you think is really, of, of course, I'm sure as the writer, you like everything about the book, but, but, but looking back on it now, now that, now that it's in mm-hmm. uh, published form, and we should point out, too, that we'll show uh, copies of your cover uh, as we're okay. talking here today uh, about your book for our viewers to be able to see that. But, but what would you say are your two or three things that, that, that you feel are the strongest or maybe you're most proud of about the story? Um, strongest or most proud of. Okay. I wasn't sure. I, I didn't know that was the direction your question was going to take as I was listening to it. Sorry about that. That's all right. <laughs> Put you on the spot. Uh, um, what I'm probably most proud of are the passages uh, describing the music that's being played. Um, I, I really uh, enjoyed writing those passages. I worked hard at, at trying to get the feel of the music, what it's like to be in the music, to be playing it. Um, and so I hope that readers will find that as well. Um, I didn't, again, I w- part of, if, if it has a sense of immediacy there, that's probably because I was discovering that for myself as I was writing the book. Um, I had, uh, the one instrument that I had any skill on at all before I started this book was probably the harmonica, which I played in college, and then I put down for almost 25 years, but... Um, it turned out that I could remember a little bit about that. And uh, thanks to the Huntington Harmonica Club, uh, I got to play the harmonica and play it in front of audiences and get the feel of what it's like to stand up in front of the band and and, uh, to do all that. And uh, I think that comes through in the book. Fantastic. Yeah, that's excellent. I wanted to ask you, too, about, I know you've had a lot of short stories published in literary journals mm-hmm. leading up into the, the publication of Song for Chance. Um, for someone out there who, who is thinking about writing or is looking to get into writing or maybe start a writing career, um, would you suggest maybe they start maybe mastering the short story first and trying to get published in those literary journals immediately? Or if they've got something uh, that's uh, of novel length, to go ahead and, and write that and, and see if they can get it published? Um, I, I would suggest that if you really want to write, you need to just write. And I would say try not to worry so much about getting published. Um, try to get your satisfaction from the writing itself, um, from sharing it with readers that, that perhaps you know and that know you. If you, if, if you can become involved in a good writing group, um, I, I think that that can be a great thing. Um, if you if you obsess about publication, you're almost certainly going to be disappointed. Either it won't come when you want it, or it won't come how you want it, or it, you know it won't be good enough. And I've gone through all of that myself. Uh, uh, as you know, I, I won an O. Henry Award in 1993. I thought that would open all the doors in the world. But guess what? My next few stories kept coming back. Mm-hmm. So it didn't, I didn't suddenly go from O. Henry Award to being a New Yorker author. I'm still not a New Yorker author. Um, so I would say focus on the writing, not the publishing. Fantastic. I think that that's great advice, too, because, um, you know, Homer Hickam talks about that a lot when, when he speaks to, to various groups. And some of our viewers maybe have heard him speak when he's come to Huntington to speak. But he always talks about, you know, the same thing. Don't worry about getting published write the story the best you can, tell the story the best way you know how, and the publication and the 
publishing aspect of it will take care of itself. Mm -hmm. So I have to ask you, now that you have Song for Chance out, you have some of these literary stories out, you, you did win the O. Henry Prize, uh, as you mentioned, in 1993. What's next? What are you working on next? Well, I'm actually, you started this interview by mentioning my Navy career, and uh, right now I'm working on a book that's set on an aircraft carrier during in the pretty much in the middle of the Cold War in about 1983-1984. So how, how, may I ask you how far along in the process you are with that book? Um, it's hard to say. Uh, I have a sabbatical, I'm hoping, coming up next year and uh, my goal is to have a complete draft completed by the end of that sabbatical year earlier if sooner. I mean earlier if possible. Um, but I have, I probably have a hundred pages or so written. Great. Excellent. And a list of scenes. A list of scenes. That was going to be my next question. Are you at the scene stage yet? But it sounds oh, yeah. like you're well on your way list. there. I have a list of scenes yet to be written. And uh, yes. Excellent. Well, we're going to have you read some passages from uh, Song for Chance here in just a moment. But before we get to that, uh, if someone is interested in getting a copy of your book uh, or getting in touch with you about the book mm -hmm. or about writing or about publishing or any aspect uh, with regards to, to that process, how can they get in contact with you and how can they get a book? Um, well, they can get a book from Red Hen Press. Uh, they can get a book from Amazon.com. Uh, and locally, they, there's a whole table covered with them in Empire Books right now as we speak. Um, the, uh, they can find more information about me at my website, which is uh, www.johnbankirk.net. And um, through there, there are links. There's also a link there to buy the book. Um, so it can be easily, easily obtained. And uh, as far as getting in touch with me personally, uh, via that website, you can link to uh, the Marshall English Department website, and my email can be found there. All right. Very good. Well, uh, as we close out our program here, we have about uh, 10 or 12 minutes or so remaining. Uh, I'm going to let you uh, read a passage, uh, if you would, well, from, right. from your book, Song, Song for Chance. And uh, one thing I, I wanted to mention that we didn't really address as you, as you picked that passage, uh, I, one of the things I really love about your, about your book and why I can't put it down and why I would be up all night reading it if, if I didn't stop myself is uh, j just how lyrical the prose is and how everything is just so smooth and it just flows from one paragraph to the next, one page to the next, one chapter to the next. So I think uh, our readers, as they listen to your passage, are, are going to pick up on that. It, it, it kind of is like a song, the way that you write the prose. It kind of reads very melodically like, uh, like, a, uh, like a song. And so I think some of our audience members will hopefully pick up on that. So uh, I'll let you uh, sort of set the scene for us on the passage that you're going to read, and, and we'll turn it over to you for a few well, minutes. Well, I'll give it a shot. Um, this, is, uh, this is a passage that takes place... In, uh, during Voss's college years, it's it's before he's basically just arrived at uh, a place called Forrester College um, in St. Louis, and um, he's already, you know, a somewhat seasoned musician in small rock bands. Uh, he had a band back in New Jersey called the uh, Johnny and the Featherweights, and um, this they're having a it's it's probably about the first week or two of school and some of the guys are have put together a jam in uh, in the basement of the dormitory uh, near the game room so I'll start there the game room had three pool tables a couple of ping pong tables and half a dozen pinball machines the pool tables were dominated by older guys with long hair and full beards who passed joints back and forth and swigged from a gallon jug of Kerbari Chablis the casual games of eight ball that were played in the afternoon had been replaced by money games of nine ball. At the far end of the room, a pair of double doors stood open. Voss could hear someone doing a, time, a, a sound check. He hauled his Vox Continental in its gray case, stencil, stenciled with his name and serial number, past the pool tables and toward the sounds. He recognized a couple of people from the other night, including a harmonica player. A heavyset guy with a soul patch had set up a drum kit toward the back of the small stage, and two skinny guys with guitars were tuning up. They all seemed to know each other already, which made Voss feel uncomfortable, but he set his gear down and walked up to them. It's an open jam, right? Got room for a keyboard? Yeah, great. You a singer? Got a mic? Upstairs, but I don't have a PA. I could run it through the amp, but it wouldn't be great. It's more than we've got, the drummer said. I'm Mike, and this is uh, Steve, is that right? 
Yeah, Steve and Kenny over there. Well, I'm Jack. I'll be back with my amp and a mic. They took their time setting up, everybody playing a couple of licks just to let the others know where he was, what he could do. Finally, the drummer spoke up. Why don't we just try a simple blues, not too fast, room for everybody to play a little. How about Statesboro blues, Voss said. I can't do that Dwayne Allman lead, Kenny said. That's okay, we'll just start with the chords, play with it, Voss said. That's the spirit, the drummer said. He struck the snare and set the tempo. Voss came in softly on the organ, spooky, slow, leaving lots of room for the guitars. Steve started strumming open chords and they were making music. Kenny was playing too, but he had the volume turned down so low they couldn't hear him. Turn it up, Steve shouted at him. Give me a minute, he shouted back. They watched him work at his fingering for another few bars. He was all over the fretboard, and then he reached down and cranked the volume. It wasn't Dwayne Allman's lead, but it filled the empty spaces in the groove with style, and before long, the room began to fill as well. They had been playing for half an hour when Voss saw Jeanette come through the door. People were dancing, and she stood in an open place on the floor and moved to the music. Voss was entranced. It was his turn to take a solo, and he took it down low, a pulse in E. Then he let his he left hand dance around the middle keys, never taking his eyes off Jeanette. She was moving with her eyes closed, and he imagined he was playing her, that what he did with his fingers was translated to what she did with her body. He could lift her up, make her throw her head back and shake her long hair behind her, or he could lean forward, lean her forward, make her bend her knees and twist slowly toward the floor. They were in sync. He picked up the pace, nodding to the drummer to mix it up a bit, and they played together for a few bars. Then the drummers came in and Voss backed off, just keeping up that pulse, liquid, a wave for the others to float on. Jeanette's eyes were open again and she was smiling at him. Voss gave a signal, and they closed the song on the beat. Whap. And people were hooting and clapping. Fantastic. Excellent, excellent. Uh, that, that's, that's a great scene in the book early on, and, uh, <laughs> and uh, we appreciate you sharing that, that with us. Well, my pleasure. So, John Van Kirk, the title of the book is Song for Chance. Congratulations, uh, and best of luck to you on that book and, and uh, in the future book that you're working on, and thanks for being with us on Chapters. All right, well, thank you, Elliot. And a final reminder, if you have a question, comment, or suggestion about this chapter's program or any program that you've seen on Armstrong Cable, we'd like to hear from you. You can send us an email at lp4, the letter L, letter P, number 4, at zoominternet.net. And we look forward to getting your comments and feedback, and we appreciate those so much here, not only for this chapter's program, the other chapter's programs that you've watched, but other programming that's featured here uh, on Armstrong Cable. Well, that's going to do it for us this time on Chapters. Please come again next time, and in the meantime, stay tuned to this station for news and views that impact you. 